I love that we're finishing uh, towards the end here some of the um, sort of the more masters as athlete issues. We spent a lot of time talking about uh, cardiac arrest and things in the younger people, but uh, you know, on a daily level, I don't see a huge number of athletes in my clinic talking about ICDs and cardiac arrest, but I see a fair number of people who have AFib, um, much more common um, in the people that I see on a daily level. I have no conflicts. Uh, all right, so we're gonna raise our hand. Uh, here, so 50-year-old male cross-country skier has a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, uh, and so the best treatment is to stop skiing. So who's going to say yes? We should just tell them to stop stop doing their activities. Who says no? Keep going. And who says I don't know? Yeah, I'm going to say I don't know. But I think actually, I I we been talking about here, a big part for me of the way I practice medicine is um, my goal is to let people um, live the life they want to lead, and I want to do whatever I can to try and help them achieve that. So this question of does intense exercise, leads to, uh, intense exercise lead to AFib? Aaron touched on this. I'm going to um, go through some of the studies. There's a fair number of them. First one goes back about 20 years now. 262 highly ranked male orienteers uh, in Britain, and then they had 370 controls. And what they basically show was that 5% of the orienteers had AFib and 0.1% of the controls did. Um, and this was in uh, people in their late 40s on average. Um, so sort of this early suggestion that there may be something there. Uh, and then the next study a few years later, uh, Luis Mont uh, from uh, Spain uh, looked at this. So they had 51 patients who had AFib, and then they looked at those who were considered sportsmen versus non-sportsmen. Um, and sports was defined as three hours per week over the last two years. And one of their key things that they talked about was that um, the predominance of the sportsmen had vagal-induced AFib. And so the way they defined vagal AFib was either episodes that started during sleep or that happened after meals. One of the big issues with this, when you go through all the studies, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit more, is number one, they're mostly retrospective studies. Um, and then as we talk about with all these, how do you quantify physical activity? Who's considered an athlete? Um, do you do questionnaires and you ask people, well, how much activity have you done in the last few years? Um, do you just follow cohorts of athletes, um, uh, like the big um, study that uh, Aaron discussed earlier from Sweden, I think that was with the skiers? Um, or do you do an objective assessment? Do you do a CPET test and say, okay, look, this is your relationship of AFib. We can see what your VO2 max is. And then how much act, um, activity are we talking about? How long? And then also, how do you ascertain the diagnosis? So do you just ask people, have you ever been told you had AFib? Or do you need to truly document an EKG and see the AFib yourself? Um, just one review article looking at this. Um, I think this was actually a really good review article looking at different arrhythmias in sport. Uh, so one of the things that they try to classify here is how do you decide what the quality of the evidence is related to your risk of AFib and exercise, and what the um, uh, type of activity was. So in animal models, when they essentially took some rats and ran them on a treadmill, then you can show, hey, look, there is this uh, relationship. But when you get to some of the higher level data, there's actually this mixed study. So when meta-analyses have been done, trying to assess the burden or amount of exercise and this relationship with AFib, it's not actually totally clear that there is a relationship. And I think it's because there's some subtleties to what the data is showing. So one of the questions is, does this influence of exercise only pertain to younger people versus older people? So one of the, this uh, meta-regression analysis is showing that, yeah, those who have, or this relationship of ex exercise and AFib really may only pertain to those who are less than the age of 50, less than the age of 60, but as you get older, there may not actually be that relationship anymore. Um, looking at it a different way, Again, here, um, the positive studies are in green, the negative studies here are in red. And what they were trying to show is that those a positive relationship of exercise and AFib was really applying to younger people, but not necessarily in the older population as you're getting to 60s, 70s, 80s. I think another key feature here is men versus women. Um, so if you look at this, uh, if we look at total physical activity and the risk of atrial fibrillation in men, there is this relationship where it's positive, where the more exercise you do, the more likely you're, you are to have AFib. But in women, you're actually seeing the opposite, that it may have a protective effect. And if you just look at the intensive physical activity, same sort of finding, that in men, there may be pro-arrhythmia, but in women, it may actually be protective. Um, I'm actually going to just skip over that. And I think 
I actually thought this was a really great slide, a really great figure. So when they actually tried to look at the data by gender and by intensity, in men, you did start to see this protective effect with moderate levels of exercise. But when you get to that intense exercise, there's an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. So moderate activity is good, that 150 minutes a week, but that high intensity activity of running from Huntington, California to Baltimore, and I lived in Baltimore, and I don't know why anyone would run to Baltimore. Um, sorry, sorry, I love Baltimore, actually. Um, that yeah, there may be actually this increased risk of atrial fibrillation, but that that may not be seen in women. So there have not been as many studies done in women compared to men, but in women you may actually just see this, the more exercise you do, the better. Now why do athletes get atrial fibrillation? Aaron touched on this a little bit, but there is some of this anatomic remodeling, and I'll show you a slide about that in a second. You get changes in the autonomic nervous system in these patients, changes in the inflammatory response. They can have electrolyte abnormalities with exercise. There can be dehydration. And Aaron talked about caffeine and alcohol, but I'll throw in here performance enhancing drugs, which we talked about in our challenging uh, cases session. And I think that's something that's important to ask about. Um, so this was a mouse model where they uh, had uh, the um, mice do exercise. Um, and what they basically showed was that those mice who exercised had increased levels of fibrosis. So that's the uh, red bars here in the exercising mice versus the sedentary mice. Um, and they had changes in their left atrial size. So the left atrium was bigger in the mice who exercised compared to the sedentary ones. Um, and they also did show changes in the autonomic nervous system for these uh, mice also, which presumably could be extrapolated into humans. And again, some of these concepts of atrial fibrosis that we're talking about, so atrial fibrosis is gonna promote atrial fibrillation, and that may be due to hemodynamic overload, so more volume, maybe more due to this left atrial hypertension. Um, inflammation, a myocarditis, or again, performance enhancing uh, substances. So overall, I think, um, when I think about this, I think exercise is good. You get this blood pressure reduction. You get a decreased risk of ischemic heart disease. Um, but as you get too much exercise, and especially in men, that there could be some of these deleterious effects, uh, including fib uh, myocardial fibrosis, left atrial enlargement, and AFib. So if I have someone who's got AFib, who's an uh, exerciser, the first thing you want to do is actually confirm that they have AFib. So you need to have an e uh, EKG, a Holter monitor, a loop recorder, some sort of smartphone EKG recording, not just one of the pulse ox monitor things that a lot of patients have, um, a treadmill test, something, just prove that it actually is AFib. You want to do a blood pressure check to be sure that um, hypertension is not one of the underlying etiologies, and then really evaluating them like I would evaluate other people. Um, so you want to just do a basic uh, lab panel of electrolytes, renal liver function, uh, thyroid, CBC, do an echocardiogram to look at cardiomyopathy or valvular disease. Um, and then you do want to ask them the questions about alcohol use, about performance enhancing drugs, um, and especially in our adult population sleep study, um, you want to ask about this history of obstructive sleep apnea. One of the questions is anticoagulation in these patients. Um, actually, this is a really confusing study. I'm going to skip over here. Um, we know about, you guys presumably know about the uh, both warfarin and the, um, the DOACs uh, that now exist, rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban, and dabigatran. We know that if AFib, you're going to be shooting with warfarin for that INR between 2.0 and 3.0, which is your best bang for your buck in terms of reduction in ischemic stroke without increasing your intracranial bleeding risk too much. Um, there are these huge studies that looked at each of the DOACs. Um, anytime I have a patient who's asking me about these medications, these are like some of the biggest studies that are randomized trials in medicine. You have about 50,000 patients among these four studies, um, which is huge looking at each of these, showing a reduction um, uh, depending on the specific DOAC you're talking about, either reduction in stroke or ischemic stroke or improvement in mortality with some of these. So when I'm thinking about these patients, I'm using the CHADS2 VAS score just like I would for a non-athlete about whether to anticoagulate them or not. I don't think there's any data that shows a reduction in stroke um, with exercise. Um, avoid contact sports. I think that's a big thing. You want to try and have these people be safe. Wear a helmet if they're going to do high-risk activities like skiing. Um, and then the question is if you have someone who's high risk and they refuse anticoagulation, you could consider the Watchman device. Um, I can't say that there's data in athletes, but um, uh, there might be the occasional person you would consider this for them. Uh, I don't know if you guys know or do not know about Watchman, but this is a left atrial appendage occluder. So it goes in the left atrial appendage, uh, it looks like a parachute is how I describe it. And then over time you get um, uh, endothelial covering of that um, uh, device 
So management of these patients, uh, so just stop exercising, right? Um, so interestingly here, uh, so what they showed in this study from uh, Hein Heidbuchel's uh, group uh, in Europe, so if you had a history of endurance sports, you're more likely to develop atrial fibrillation if you had a history of atrial flutter. And for those people who um, got an atrial flutter ablation and they continued during endurance sports, there's this non-significant increased risk of AFib. Um, and again, non-significant depending on how you uh, looked at it here. Um, but you can't ever get anyone to stop doing endurance sports, and I don't think that's the right answer. Um, we'll skip over that also. So uh, in general, as we're thinking about the therapy here, you want to follow the guidelines for AFib. We're talking about rate control for some patients. I think for athletes, rhythm control um, really is the big thing because they're going to be symptomatic with their AFib. So beta blockers, um, you're going to try and use, but they're not going to like it. And then depending if they're a competitive athlete or not, it may be on a restricted drug list and they may not be able to take it. Um, calcium channel blockers, maybe. Sometimes you'll try it. Uh, digoxin, just as a single agent or even just in these athletic population, it's not going to work. Um, digoxin doesn't really work for those um, who exercisers. Uh, who are exercisers. And then so for a lot of these people, if they have good rate control at rest, um, I may not have them on any medications, and especially if they're not very symptomatic. Uh, but I will try and do a treadmill test because I want to see what their peak heart rate is that they're getting to. And I want to see if you if they're really truly still able to achieve what their um, goal heart rate is or their goal um, uh, or expected duration. For rhythm control, I might do pill in the pocket, and I tend to do that for a fair amount of my uh, athletes. Um, and for pill in the pocket, you're going to be using either fluconide or propafenone, but you have to use either a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker 30 minutes beforehand. There's a lot of discussion about using disopyramide um, for this, for vagal AFib, and I really, I searched a lot trying to find data for the use of it here, and I just can't find any. I really can't find studies that say that disopyramide is the best agent for vagal AFib. We just talk about it and say it's the right thing to do. Um, but a lot of people don't like being on disopyramide. You get these anticholinergic effects. Um, and especially for older men, the prostatism that can go with it, it doesn't work well. Um, so I oftentimes will, um, again, either do pill in the pocket. You can try and do the class 1C agents, but again, you need a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker with those. Um, you can try some of the class 3 agents like sotalol, dronaterone, or amiodarone, but they all do have beta blocker properties to them. Dofetilide is the one agent um, where you don't need to be on an AV nodal agent, um, and it doesn't have any beta blocker in it. AFib ablation is, frankly, something that I go to relatively quickly for these patients. They're also very eager to get this a lot of times because they want whatever the fastest thing that they can uh, get. Um, one of the classic papers uh, in electrophysiology sh um, just showing that the triggers for AFib often start in the pulmonary veins. Um, and there's different ablation strategies you can use for this. Um, uh, you can either use RF ablation for this. Um, uh, and this is just one of our examples of a patient here where we're doing a pulmonary vein isolation. There's cryo balloon also that's available um, for this. I don't think that there's one that's better versus the other in terms of an athletic population. Um, in general, what we know is that ablation is going to work better than antiarrhythmics in terms of preventing arrhythmias. Um, and what actually will be fascinating just parenthetically in the world of uh, electrophysiology is in the spring, either at ACC or at HRS, they're going to release the Cabana trial, um, which is going to be a huge trial looking at whether AFib ablation has a lot of more hard endpoint benefit compared to ablation, actually compared to antiarrhythmic agents. One paper that I found about uh, AFib ablation uh, in competitive athletes, so 20 athletes who underwent ablation, 18 of them had um, a success with the procedure. Um, all of them reinitiated tr training, so 20 hours per week, which is pretty good. Um, and they all had an improvement in their maximum exercise capability compared to when they were in AFib itself. Um, and there was no difference in the success rate of the procedure. Um, a different study looking at controls versus non-endurance athletes and endurance athletes. So success rates seem to be the same with ablation, um, uh, depending, uh, regardless of whether you're uh, an athlete or not. So overall here, um, so exercise seems to increase the AFib risk risk at higher intensities in younger men. And I sort of, uh, that's what the data, at least how I interpret it. I think overall moderate exercise is good. Um, and then in terms of the treatment for these people, anticoagulation based on their chads 2 vas score, um, rate control for some, rhythm control for most. I think that's what I got. So thank you.